All right, let's get started. Once again, thank you for joining us today. My name is Will Penfield, and on behalf of Everbridge, I'm excited to present this webinar, Four Elements of Effective Crisis Management. During the event, Regina Phelps will discuss creating a crisis management team, incident action planning, and crisis communications. Following Regina, you'll hear from Annie Azrari, who will cover how the Everbridge solution can help your organization during a crisis. After the presentation, we'll have a short Q&A session with our speakers. We encourage everyone to participate and ask questions during the webinar. You can submit your questions by typing in the questions widget and submitting to all panelists. If you'd like to tweet along and share insights from today's program, please use the hashtag CrisisMGMT. Links to the slides and a recording of the webinar will be sent out to all registrants by the end of the week. You can also look for a link to recordings for all of our webinars on everbridge.com under our resources section. And now I would like to introduce you to our speakers. First up, we have Regina Phelps, who is an internationally recognized expert in the field of emergency management and continuity planning. Since 1982, she has provided consultation and educational speaking services to clients in four continents. She is founder of Emergency Management and Safety Solutions, a consulting company specializing in incident management, exercise design, and continuity and pandemic planning. Clients include many Fortune 500 companies. Ms. Phelps is a frequent top-rated speaker at well-known conferences such as the Disaster Recovery Journal, CPNM, and the World Conference on Disaster Management. She is frequently sought out for a common sense approach and clear, clean deli delivery of complex topics. Following Regina, you'll hear from Annie Asrari, who is the Director of Product Management at Everbridge, and she will be discussing the Everbridge solution and how it relates to crisis management and crisis communications. And now, without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker. Regina, you may begin. Great. Thanks very much, Will. First of all, it's a pleasure to be with all of you today, and thanks for that kind introduction, Will. Um, today I'll be talking about the four elements of effective crisis management. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm really fascinated with crises and disasters of all kinds. And I suppose if you've ever heard me speak before, you probably already know that about me. But I wonder, how is it possible that some companies can have a major incident and they seem to sail through it? Others, not so much. There are many aspects to effective crisis management, but there are four absolutely essential elements that must be present for an effective response. If they aren't there, then in the initial moments of the crisis, it will likely be a long and painful response and recovery. So let's take a quick look at my agenda, if you will. What we'll be talking about today is I'm going to start briefly by talking about the, uh, the um, uh, definitions of the types of emergencies. I'll talk about routine and crisis emergencies. And then I'm going to really spend the majority of my time talking about the four essential elements, team structure, incident, response, incident uh, assessment process and uh, teams, talk about action planning, and then I'll talk about effective communications. So let's dig into this. And what I want to start with, first of all, is actually the definitions of a routine and crisis emergency. Now, these aren't my definitions. They're actually the definitions by the uh, University of Harvard and the professors that teach the crisis management program there, which I had the privilege to take several years ago. It's a nice context to frame our conversation here today. So a routine emergency, what the heck is that? It's really what all of us on this call do for a living. And that, by that I mean, it's, I'm not saying that it's an easy emergency, but I'm saying it's something that's relatively predictable. It's in your risk profile. It's something that allows us to have advanced preparation, and you can actually take advantage of experience from previous activations or from somebody else who's had something like that. So what that means is that as planners, we've thought about this before, We've planned for it, we probably have trained for it, and we also have done exercises. So it's something that we are expecting. I contrast that to a crisis emergency, which is different. And what makes it different, as far as the definition is concerned, is novelty. So let me give you some examples of what I'm saying now. Uh, it could be a threat that you've never encountered before. So for example, going back to 9-11, two planes hitting the Trade Center. It had never happened before. It was beyond our wildest dreams. And if I had ever suggested that for an exercise for my clients who resided in the Trade Center, they would have thought I was nuts. It could be some event that's familiar, but it's happening at unprecedented speeds. 
Think of Hurricane Sandy. New York was prepared and expecting a hurricane, but it happened so rapidly and so quickly, and the flooding was so significant that it basically flooded a lot of the southern tip of Manhattan, and it created a crisis. Or it could be something like a confluence of forces. And so it's not something new, but it's a combination of things. Think of Hurricane Katrina, a major hurricane followed immediately by a levee failure. Those two things in combination made it very difficult for them to respond. So because of that novelty, the plans and the behaviors and things that we practice just don't work. And in some cases, they might even be counterproductive. Now, how do you distinguish between the crisis and the uh, routine? And that sometimes is actually our job, our job as actual emergency or, or business continuity professional, is we have to first of all diagnose the elements of novelty. Many times the people that are managing the event have their head way down into the weeds and they're working hard to manage and they don't notice that things have started to change or are different. So that might be one of your tasks. And when we begin to understand that there's something is novel that we actually then have to improvise, which means many of our plans, our processes, our training is not going to be adequate. And we have to literally redefine ourselves and we have to cope with all new possibilities. So that means our response has to be creative and adaptable as we go through and we execute on these plans. So those are things to keep in mind as I talk through this really the four essential elements of a crisis. Now when I talk through that, I want to start first of all by what I call the six C's. So this sounds probably like a mathematical question, and on Pi Day I suppose that's a good idea. But I think that the four elements are critical because it's going to get you the six C's. And what does that mean? For a crisis to be able to be effectively managed, you need to have these six things present. First of all, you've got to have command and control. Ultimately, that's what we need in order to move the organization, our team, the crisis forward. Thirdly, we need to actually collaborate. And we need to collaborate often not just with our own internal partners, but people outside of our organization, and possibly people in our business, but they are external to the event. We have to coordinate all of our activities so that we are not doubling up on some things and some things we're completely missing. We have to be effective at communication, and again, to all of our key stakeholders. Because ultimately, what we're looking for in this response and what people expect from us, frankly, is consistency. So those six C's are really important. And the way we get those six C's, in my definitions, is about the four essentials. And I'm going to talk about these in length. In fact, I could talk about any one of these for an hour plus. So I'm going to condense everything into a very short period of time today. You have to know what the team structure is and the roles and responsibilities. You have to have a very clear incident assessment process. You have to have a team in place and an escalation strategy. You need to know how to develop an action plan. And lastly, you have to issue effective and timely communications. So let's first of all talk about team structure, roles, and responsibilities. This is an important one, and many times people really don't think much about it. And it's critical to st stop and think of how you're going to be structured and what it's going to look like. So for many of our clients, most of our clients are very large multinational corporations, and they almost always have a tactical team and a strategic team. If your organization is small, less than 500 employees, very likely you'll, you'll have one team that does both activities. The tactical team in most large companies is represented by the key department. So you'll imagine who those folks are. Things like um, technology and facilities and security and the key lines of business and HR and communications and legal and finance and so on. Those people are going to tactically manage our response. But then there needs to be also a strategic team, and that's usually where you're going to find the executives, because their role at time of crisis is very different than the tacticians. I'll talk about that in a moment. So understanding, first of all, we'll probably have two teams for most organizations, and again, a smaller one, we'll have them both combined. So then the question is, how do you structure this big group of people? Is it your usual reporting structure, meaning it's your normal organizational chart, or do you consider something like the incident command system? Uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. Or are you going to use something else? For the purposes of our conversation today, I'm really going to talk about two uh, formats, and I'm going to talk about doing it as usual, and I'll also talk about the incident command system. So what's the plus of doing it as you always do, having the organization structured as it always is? Well, that's what you know. <clears throat> so that's good. But there are a lot of downsides to it, actually. The first one might be span of control. 
you have somebody who's in charge of this big team, and stop and think about how many people they have to talk to to figure out what the heck is going on with the business and with the response and with the communications and so on. The average um, uh, reporting structure in an emergency should be somewhere between four to seven people, no more. And if you use your usual reporting structure, you might have 15, 20 people that are person in charge, I'm going to use the term incident commander, has to talk to in order to find out what the heck is going on. So the span of control is way too big. There also could be lots of silos of responsibility because many times people will be doubling down and teams will be doing the same thing. And that's because, again, there's not a clear um, a structure that's going to help manage that. There also could be duplication of effort, things you miss completely, uh, and again, because of these big silos that we have. And you also ultimately don't have a lot of clear authority because everybody's running their department like they normally do. What we always ask our clients to do is to reconsider how they structure their teams. And we're op trying to optimize on the best efficiencies we can possibly get. And what our feeling is, is the best way you can do that is to have a more organized emergency response. I'm a huge fan of the incident command system, and if you've ever heard me speak before, I'm, I, I, I implemented it in probably the vast majority of our clients. It's actually been around since the 1970s, came out of my fair state, California, and it's now used by public and private sectors across the world. I've taught it in four continents, um, and it's required uh, since 2005 in every city, state, uh, federal, county, uh, in the United States. So anybody that responds to you, like police and fire, FBI, et cetera, they're all using ICS. So it's something that's uh, convenient and um, familiar, and that's important, especially if you're dealing with the initial emergency response of an event. An ICS structure kind of looks like this. I'm going to quickly talk about this, and I would say to you, if you don't want to use ICS, Frankly, you can use a very similar structure to organize your team. So the box at the top is what we call the command box. That's where our incident commander is. You might call them a variety of things, but that's what this calls in ICS. And then right below that, you'll see the communications box for all of our key communicators dealing with traditional and social media and other forms of communication, trying to outbound information and receive information from our key stakeholders. Below that, you're going to see uh, essentially four boxes. The operations box is very uh, tactical in response, and in a corporation that's very likely going to be facilities, security, and technology. If you have things like environmental health and safety, they might also be there. And what you think about is really the recovery of your business, and it's the operations to do that. So you need a building, you need security, you need safety, and you need technology. If you have those things, you're good to go. Logistics in a, in a corporate model is most commonly uh, human resources, dealing with the human-related aspects of the emergency. Uh, in a public sector uh, environment, it will also be procurement. We found that, that it works better, actually, for procurement to live in finance in a corporate setting, but it's up to you, you know, how you organize your team. Planning and intelligence is actually the key lines of business. So uh, depending on what your company is, those key lines, as well as the legal, uh, maybe corporate compliance, those types of individuals. And then lastly, finance, how you pay your bills, APAR, treasury operations, general ledger. So then, that's how we're structured in many of my clients. But you can do the same thing and not call it ICS. If you think about how you be logically grouped together and how you manage the span of control is by the fact that every one of those boxes has a team leader who basically aggregates all the information and reports it up to the incident commander. So we actually have a more effective management tool, both at the box level, if you will, and then all the way up to the incident commander. So then you might be saying to yourself, well, what's that, that, that strategic team doing, those pesky executives? Well, they have basically, in our view, four roles. And they're very different than the tacticians. The first thing they're going to do is provide strategic and policy oversight. So they're thinking about the big picture issues. They're also dealing with approving the large expenditure of funds. Our incident management team at the tactical level probably has an approval to spend a certain amount of money. And then beyond that, they need to ask permission, and that's where that comes in. A key role is acting as a senior spokesperson to all stakeholders. So whether that's your board of directors, um, major customers, government people, 
of all those are critical. And then lastly, they might be asked to be the immediate spokesperson if the situation warrants it. A good example of that is, pardon me, in our clients that have had uh, active shooter situations, the CEO is often the media spokesperson. So once you have that, then what you need to do is you need to make sure you have a plan so we understand the structure. Critical. Now, we need to talk about who's in charge at all the levels, what the roles and responsibility are, and we want to make sure that everybody that's part of the team actually has a checklist so we know exactly what they're doing. And your plans and checklists should basically fit your risk profile. So go back to your routine emergency. What's that? Is it an earthquake, a fire, a hurricane, a severe winter storm like they're having in the east today? Make sure your checklists and plans fit the routine emergencies. So figure out the structure, figure out who's going to do what, and then make sure everybody knows. <clears throat> the second is really important, and I will tell you of all the things that we talk about in the four elements, this is the one I find missing the most. It's almost as if many company plans actually, in the, in the process of the incident or crisis management, notice that we're going to have an issue, and then all of a sudden the plan is activated. And you wonder, well, what happened between the emergency and the plan activation? Who came together? Who made the decision that we were going to activate? And many times that is completely missing. So let's talk about how you can do that. Well, we recommend, first of all, <laughs> pardon me, is that you have an incident assessment team. Now, the incident assessment team is critically important. So first of all, who should be on this team? Now, when you think about it, it's most common uh, who is on this team is where the emergencies come from. Think about your organization. Where do most of your disasters or crises come from? Facilities, security, technology, sometimes HR. What you want is to think about who should be on this team. And those individuals should be basically very well trained, understanding their role and responsibility. They get a call in the middle of the night. They're told to jump on a bridge. They actually come on a call and they actually assess the event. So determine, first of all, who should be on the team. And most of our clients, that includes the incident commander, facility, security, technology. Sometimes it will include HR. And the thing is that you keep in mind is you want the team to be relatively small. And if you need to add more people based on the incident, you simply do that. The team has very clear responsibility. <clears throat> they're supposed to conduct initial assessment. So they find out what's going on, and then they're going to make some decisions. They go through the criteria and the escalation strategies for plan activation. And then they call the question, as we call it. They decide whether or not they're going to activate the plan. And our belief is that any of the members should be able to activate the plan. It shouldn't be like three out of four, or all four, or seven out of seven. It's whoever shows up based on the emergency. <clears throat> Communication for this team is critically important. If you utilize an emergency notification system, it's a great way to have pre-built templates for your IAT. That goes out, they're asked to join the bridge, and they come together. We always figure out the virtual communication, but also a physical one. For some reason, maybe after an earthquake, you lost technology, you're not able to communicate electronically, you want to make sure that you actually have a physical place where you can actually meet as well. The first thing this team does is really important, and one that a lot of people haven't quite figured out, which is how do you get situational awareness? What does that mean? How do you know what's going on? And where are you getting that information from? So that's the first task this team has. Now, very likely, the person who reports up this story or this issue will be the one that has some information, but other people may know a lot as well. So what do you know? What's impacted? <laughs> Is it just your facility? Is it your employees? Is it your visitors? Hmm. Are there impacts to your business? And what about the impact of the facility reputation? What's the overall effect of the incident? Are the people injured or killed? Is the building available? Is your technology down? Tell us more. And then once you know all of that, what we also ask people to do is look at broadly what kind of event this is. Is it local, just you? If it's just you, then that even puts sometimes more pressure on you because no one else is having a problem, and so they don't know why you're not answering your phone. If it's regional, like this today in the east with a snowstorm, 
more people know about it, but it also means that more people aren't available to help you. In a national event, and maybe only a few places in the country are impacted, like 9-11. Or maybe even an international event, like a tsunami or floods or typhoons. Think of the Madrid uh, train bombing several years ago, or think of the, the big fire in the hotel in um, uh, Bombay. Any of those kind of events <clears throat> result in potentially an impact to your company. So what type of event is it? And then what we do is we ask our folks to talk about five things. Now, we used to build really complex criteria, and we realized you don't need to do that. Frankly, the only thing you need to talk about is five things in order to know whether you have to activate your plan. The first thing you want to talk about is people. Are lives in danger? Is there a business, uh, uh, is there a life safety issue? Is there, is there an impact to employees or visitors? So always you start with emergency response, you always talk about life safety. Second, what's happening with our facilities? What's happening with our critical infrastructure? That could be things such as our computer system, our phones, our buildings. What's going on with that stuff? And we tie in that technology piece. Is there a disruptive to our technology services? Is there an information security issue? In the cyber world now that we live in, that becomes even a bigger problem. Fourth, is there an impact to our mission critical business activities, our time sensitive issues? Does this impact our ability of our company to do business? And is there some financial impact as well? The first four are very subjective. I mean, excuse me, are very clear. The fourth one is a fifth one is subjective. And that's simply the fact is do we have a potential if we don't handle this event in a good manner that we could actually have a brand or reputational impact to our business? So five really simple things to talk about. So when we run initial assessment teams, the team gets on the phone. The first thing that happens is we talk about the situational awareness. Everybody shares what they know. Then what we do is we discuss the five issues. People, facilities, technology, business. Is there an imp a possible impact to our reputation brand? We also want to know, is it just us? Is it regional? Is it national? Is it international? And then we actually plot this out. So you look at this overall matrix, we literally do this on a call. And then what we do is we ask, the next question is, what's the severity level? Your company might have its own severity level. So for many of our clients, there's severity levels of one through three or one through four, one being minor, three or four being the most severe. We ask them to label it. So that way they go, okay, this is a level two or a level three. It's a little bit like shorthand. When you know it's a level two or three, then automatically you're beginning to think of the kind of response that you need to do. And then what we do is we call the question. Does this incident meet our activation criteria? If the answer is yes, then we're going to activate a plan. We're activating our emergency operations center. We're calling all of our folks in. And then we're going to inform our, inform our executives. Conversely, it could be no. But I will tell you, if it was big enough for you to get on a call, you had better monitor it because things could change. So just because you don't activate does not mean that it's not serious and does not require your attention. So somebody on the call is assigned for the monitoring job. Their job is to basically keep us informed about what's going on. So it's a very concise and simple process. And I would ask you to look at your plans. Do you have an initial assessment team? Do you have a process in place? Do they know what their job is? Do they know how to come together? Do they know how, what kind of criteria you're going to use? Those things are so important that if you haven't figured them out at the very beginning, you're going to stumble right away. And what we find in many of our clients is that when they don't have that kind of process, what happens is that they're slow and they wait too long. And then they're really behind the eight ball when the crisis begins to worsen and they're sl they haven't yet uh, activated their teams. So number three, developing an incident action plan. Now this is one of actually the hallmarks of ICS. It's absolutely essential. And yet, I find most companies don't do this. So it's a very simple process. It's not rocket science at all, but it takes practice and a little bit of discipline. 
And if you imagine your team has come together, and if you are utilizing the incident command system, our incident commander would call together the four leaders of the boxes, operations, finance, planning and intelligence, logistics, and then our communications team, so there'd be five of them, and the incident commander, and they're going to talk through what they need to do to respond. But let me talk about the steps, because they're pretty simple. Every IAP has basically four very simple things. So it's, it's so easy, but yet most companies don't do it. The first part of the IAP is that you always list and discuss the incident status, any new situational awareness. So at the beginning, of course, that's the actual um, initial um, uh, information you've had to activate the plan. But as the situation continues, of course, it will change and evolve over time. Then what you're going to do is you're going to have very specific strategic objectives that are going to be uh, written by our team leaders of those five boxes to actually respond to this situation. We're going to make sure that every single thing is assigned, and we're also going to make sure that we determine what the operational period is. So an operational period is how long do you work on those objectives before you come back together and you actually assess status, learn more situational awareness, and then revisit those objectives, very likely write more. So this is a really simple process, but most people don't discipline themselves to do it. And what happens then is that in the response, many people go in many different directions. All IAP should be written uh, for a lot of reasons, of course. It provides for less confusion and less communication, but it's something also that can easily be shared. <clears throat> so let me give you an example. Some of our clients in the East Coast today had already done their, their actual assessment. Uh, team meetings yesterday, and in some cases, they started it the day before. Why? Because we knew this storm was coming to the east. So they met on a, uh, met on either face-to-face -face or by phone. They went through the situational awareness, which, of course, is what's going on with the weather service. They make some additional plans. They look at issues that might be happening in their building, and they begin to check and uh, make some decisions about strategies of open or close how we're going to communicate, do people come to work, all of that stuff. Really simple. And then as the plan continues, then they look at the next day, they look and see if there's any changes, they modify the plan, and then when the actual event occurs, as of today, uh, in some communities the snow isn't as bad or the weather's not as severe, and maybe they're adjusting their plans on the fly. The good thing about doing all of this is it allows you to then print the IAP, the Incident Action Plan, you can PDF it, you can send it to anybody or everybody. You can send it to your executives, you can send it to other key departments, so everyone knows what's going on. It's not a surprise. It's not rocket science, but people don't often do it. So very simple steps. You want to make sure that, first of all, you've got their incident a situation assessed. How do you do that? Um, and I'm not being pejorative to say that, but there's many ways you can get information. Are you only relying on the news? Are you listening to uh, what's happening on social media? Are you following traditional uh, media? Are you talking to vendors, employees, government officials, contractors? How do you get your information? And then what do you do with it? How do you display it? How do you um, save it? How do you make sure everybody on the team knows about it? That sounds simple. It's not so easy. So you want to make sure that you actually have uh, all of the ways to bring all this information together so that it's helpful. Then you want to write your objectives. And you want to make sure that you've got, obviously, the resources available to complete those tasks. We're very picky about writing objectives. I know this sounds completely crazy, but we are. Because one of the things I've learned after doing this for many years is that if an objective is well written, everybody knows what you're telling them to do. If it's poorly written, people are kind of clueless. The way we write objectives are very simple. It's a short, simple sentence. But the first word of every objective starts with an action-oriented verb. And a, an example of an a, a objective might be something such as assess information technology impacts, contact emergency responders, develop response plans, activate business continuity plans, determine uh, impacts to facilities. All of those first words tell the person who got the uh, objective given to them what the heck they're supposed to do. 
So it's worth spending a little time making sure that they're written well. And most of our clients actually have a list of pre-written objectives, and they look through them, and they actually make them and drop them into their plans without having to think on the fly. You want to assign all the objectives, either to a particular team or to a person, that allows us to have less confusion, less duplication of effort, or having things that are completely not being done. Especially in the beginning of a crisis, everybody wants to focus on one or two things. And many times they're being covered by other teams, but no one knows that, and everybody focuses on those small items when we should be looking at a broader spectrum. Then you want to determine when the operational period is, which is when you meet again. Uh, in the beginning part of an emergency, it might be short. It might be an hour. Um, but then as the emergency goes longer, has legs, uh, it's, it's a longer period of time, four, six, eight hours, and so on. Uh, and then obviously if a crisis happens in the middle of an operational period, you can meet everybody and talk again, but otherwise you're going to stay with that schedule. And now that we have a plan, we can actually talk to all the identified key stakeholders, which could be key customers. It's going to be obviously your executives. It might be other locations of your business. Uh, now you can tell people what you're doing, and it's very empowering for everybody that's involved. So it's really important. How can we get good at building an IAP? <clears throat> My suggestion to you is this, is that you actually do what we call um, ripped from the news exercises. So what does that mean? So in our business, we do, I design about 100 large exercises every year. Um, but I'll tell you, besides we're doing a big exercise, maybe once or twice a year, the way you build muscle memory in your team is by doing little, short, 15, 30-minute experiences. How do you do that? Go to a newspaper. Look through the pages. I bet on every page you're going to find an exercise. Power outage, flood, active shooter, a hurricane, winter storm, tornado, the list is endless. Then what you do is you bring together, first of all, maybe you have your entire team in the room, your entire crisis or incident management team in the room. And the first people that are, that are pulled up to play are going to be our initial assessment team. You tell them what the story is, we make an assessment right there. Do we activate? Yes. Okay, great. What are we going to do next? We're going to build an IAP into an action plan. And we, it, 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 right then and there, in that real moment, tell people write their initial objectives and then they report them out to everybody. We see if there's duplication, we see if things are missed, we practice. And you do that for a while, you actually get really good. And that helps you when you have this crisis. And thankfully for most of us, we don't have those crises very often, so we need those kind of little mini practices. The fourth and critically important one is effective and timely communications. I've done lots of talks for Everbridge on this particular issue, and I could talk for many hours on it, but I'm going to talk just very briefly about the things that I think you need to consider. So for effective and timely communications, you know, they just don't happen. You have to really work that you make sure that you have the right plans and the right tools. And both of those are really important. So we want to make sure, first of all, that we have a communication plan that includes the authorities. What does that mean? We want to make sure that it's really clear in your plan, your communications plan, your crisis communications plan, who has the authority to approve messaging. Now, many times, as we know, communications are not very timely in many organizations because there's a big effort or hassle in getting communications approved. Who has the authority to actually uh, give approval to communications? And let me give you a quick example about that. When we write crisis communications plans, we believe that there should be three types of communications that you're looking at. One is emergency response, the second is more tactical communications, and the third is more strategic. So if you stop and think about that, that's how we begin to really look at the authorities. Under emergency response, those are things like um, an alarm goes off in the building, a public address uh, uh, message needs to be made, or any other kind of a, um, communication that requires immediate response, and it's about life safety. There should be very minimal communication requirements for approval, and more than likely it's going to be your security team or your facilities team or someone like that. They should not have to ask for approval from anybody else. This is life safety. 
The next level of communications, as far as authorities are concerned, would be tactical. And that could be things like activating business continuity plans, telling people to go to your alternate site, all kinds of things that should not require complicated communication approvals. It could probably easily be done by either the key lines of business with communications in concert, or maybe other small groups. Strategic communications require much more uh, thought and much more approvals. I think that's because of the issue related to impact to your brand, also going out to key stakeholders, and <clears throat> those might require then those more lengthy communications. But if you haven't organized them in those kinds of buckets, as I've mentioned, emergency response, tactical or strategic, what happens is it's really difficult to know who approves what and how is that going to happen and all of that. The second key thing is pre-written templates. The most common thing we find when we look at an organization is they have not figured that part out, uh, and that's a problem. And it makes for a very slow response, and I'll talk more about that in just a minute. And then lastly is the right tools. What are you using to communicate with people? Um, and that's another key issue. There's lots and lots and lots of things you could use, but what are you going to use, and who owns that tool in your organization? So to peel this back just a little bit more, the communications plan really should clearly outline, as I mentioned earlier, who can write the communications. And this may sound kind of crazy, but who can edit them and who can approve them? So who writes them, who edits them, who approves them? Uh, the reason we actually focus on editing is because sometimes we'll find that somebody is, um, writes communication, and then all of a sudden a lot of people want to opine on it. Like HR says, ooh, I wish we would say this, and then the key line of business is, ooh, we need to say that. And after a while, then it takes forever. So who writes the communications? It's probably your communications team. Who has the right to edit them? I'd have as few people as possible, and who ultimately can approve them. That should be clearly delineated for the three types of communications I talked about. Emergency response, tactical communications, and strategic. Those key things are really important. This, is, uh, this little activity of thinking of these four, three categories is really important. This is a great whiteboard activity for your communications department, as well as your incident commander and some other folks uh, in your organization. Figure out who owns emergency communications, who has the right to write, edit, and approve them, what about the tactical things, and what about strategic things. If you can figure that out, your comms plan is going to rock because you've figured out the, the thing that is going imp to impact some people the most. Then we have to have pre-written templates. Oh my gosh. I was just actually reading it and auditing a communication plan uh, yesterday, and it was actually a fabulous plan. It had lots of really great aspects to it. It failed completely to have any templates. So that means every time there's an emergency, that comms team has to pull out a white piece of paper and start from scratch. That should never happen, especially in this day of social media where you need to get comms out rapidly. You want to make sure that you've got at least a basic message you don't even have to know what the disaster is exactly to have a variety of pre-written basic messages that could go out to your key stakeholders. Something has happened, we're investigating, we'll get back to you as soon as possible. Just some initial holding statements. And then likely you can actually have a series of ones below that. But when you look at these pre-written templates, they should be not just a press release, no one issues those for hours. What about short messaging that's going to go out on text? What about Twitter? What about your Facebook page? Uh, what about a LinkedIn post? It's all the social media ones. So think about those kinds of audiences and those kinds of tools that you're going to be using. It's just why you need to understand what the tools are as well. So the pre-written and pre-approved communication templates, so we're not wasting time to literally um, write them on the fly. And these templates, again, are in these major categories that I mentioned earlier. They're so important. Uh, all of the pre-written uh, templates for paging, for example, or sending out text messages to your employees or to your key stakeholders, those should all be done for at least the most basic things at the very beginning. And then you want to look at all the tools you have. Now, there's a lot of them, and I've listed very few of them here. But you, I mean, there's a lot of ways to communicate. But first of all, this is another kind of whiteboard activity. Figure out what are all the ways you could communicate. And then figure out who owns them. Who owns that tool? Who can be communicated with on that tool? What stakeholder would use that tool? 
or have to hear messaging on that tool. So this is, again, another example of a great whiteboard activity. I mentioned just three here because they're very simple. Public address systems that very likely would be owned by facilities or security, and that's going to be obviously for only the people that are in the particular building that that PA system serves. Two-way radio is still a really great source of uh, communication uh, amongst folks, very likely facilities and security and maybe some other key people within your organization. But how are we letting everybody else know? And that's really where an emergency notification system really kicks in. ENSs are really no longer a luxury um, in this day and age of the need for rapid communication. They allow you, as, as noted on the slide, to be able to quickly send out messaging in many forms to your employees, but also to others. So, you know, obviously mobile phones, SMS messages, your office, your home, your work, your home email. Um, let me just say one thing about using ENS is that not only should it be used in concert with your employees, we are really trying to get our client population to look at them as a much broader tool. What about all your key vendors? Would you put them in there? What about communications to some of your key communications folks like news media? What about making sure that you have a, a group for your um, incident assessment team? And what about your um, uh, crisis management team? And what about your executives? And what about your board? Why don't you use it for everybody? Uh, and then, of course, that becomes who, who authorizes those messages, who actually deploys the system, but it allows you to use a tool very effectively to reach a large number of people, not just your employees. Before I move on, let me just say there's one more thing about uh, using an ENS with your employees. It's only as good as the data that's in it. And we have discovered over the years that we have many clients who have a heck of a time getting personal data from their employees. They don't want to share their home email, or they don't want to share their home phone number, they don't want to give you your pers their personal self. Now that's a problem because if the information within the ENS is not very good, then of course your system of communication is going to fall apart right away. So I would just say to all of you is that you want to make sure that people understand why this information is so important. Because if they really understand it, things like, you know, you'll find out whether you should come to work tomorrow. Or we'll be able to tell you if there's an urgent situation going on in the building, like an active shooter. It, it's a really great tool, but many times I think companies have to market it to their employees so they understand the value of hearing from their employer, maybe in off hours because of an emergency at their facility and whether or not they come to work tomorrow, where they go, et cetera. So you really need to think about that. So what I would like to just sort of end with is I really want you to consider the successful crisis management really does require several things. And it really does require the four things I've talked about. <clears throat> if you don't have these, you are going to stumble to the finish line. So going back to the right team structure for your company, is it something like ICS or are you going to utilize your own existing structure? You have to have really clearly defined and documented processes. Who does what in those teams? clear roles and responsibilities, ideally a checklist for every position that sits in that team. The incident assessment process and the team is so important. Who's on that team? How do they come together? What kind of information do they use to actually make an assessment? What kind of authorities do they have? Do they have the ability to activate the plan or do they need to ask permission? All of that stuff needs to be figured out. The third thing is that action planning piece, having a clear plan of action with clear reporting timelines so that we know how long we're going to work on something before we report status. That helps you build all of your briefing schedules, like when do you brief the executives, when do you have your news conference. It should all be based on this concept of the action planning process and these operational periods. And lastly, and uh, very importantly, is the timely communications. Never in my 35 years of practice have I have a, had a client ever say to me, gee, I wish uh, that uh, people stopped communicating because they're just communicating too much. It never happens. The number one thing people always say at the end of any incident is, I never heard from my employer. They were too slow. They didn't tell me what to do. There's lots of issues related to that. So that goes back to pre-written plans with templates, effective tools, but also making sure that the signing authority and the approval authority is clearly documented so that we understand exactly what we need to do. And then lastly, uh, you're only as good as training and exercises. So you can have all the stuff I've talked about. And if it's only in a document on a shelf, 
it's probably worthless. So our belief is, is that the most important thing you do as a continuity professional is actually doing effective training and exercises with the emphasis on exercises. Because you can talk, talk, talk till you're blue in the face and you can read a document, but until you have to do it, it's a very different story. So I ask you to think about the training and the exercises to build those four elements into your effective crisis management team. So on that note, Will, I'm handing it back to you. Thank you so much, right, Regina. Thank you, Regina. Go ahead. Yeah, now we're yeah. going to turn it over to Andy, who will talk a little bit about Everbridge. Yeah. So uh, I just wanted to give a quick overview of what Everbridge does and how does it fit into your crisis management plans. Uh, Regina covered the four elements that you need to keep in mind for having successful crisis management plans and we just want to show you how Everbridge could help uh, with that process. So Everbridge is a software company that focuses on two things and two things only, keeping people safe and businesses running. All of our products are designed with those two things in mind and we have products that uh, are geared towards life safety of employees and we have products that are focused on operational business continuity uh, situations like IT alerting and we have products that are focused on community engagement. Just a quick overview of our customers, we have uh, top 24 of the uh, 25 uh, busiest airports in North America. Um, as you can see, eight of the top 10 largest cities uh, in the U.S. Um, Gartner has ranked Everbridge as the leader in the industry twice in their magic quadrant. Everbridge is the only company in this space that is a public um, entity. Now, we all know that we are living in a world of increasing threats. More and more crises are happening every day. Uh, we know that there are man-made uh, disaster, uh, man disasters and natural disasters like Hurricane Sandy. So an example you see here uh, is the Orlando shootings. We have the Nice terrorist attacks, uh, San Bernardino, and Hurricane Sandy. These are all examples of location-based emergencies or crises that um, employers need to communicate to, your, to their employees, to their uh, vendors, uh, contractors, stakeholders, management, traveling employees, loan workers. All of those people may be affected by these types of emergencies and we need to be able to ensure their safety. We also know that by 2020, 72% of all employees are going to be mobile. So we live in a world of increasing threats with more mobile employees. That's a dangerous combination and we need to make sure that we can ensure the safety of our constituents. We've been hearing from our own customers. We know our customers have uh, distributed teams, large campuses, their employees travel all the time and they really want to be able to have plans in place and communicate to their employees in case of natural disasters, tornadoes, active shooters, um, fire in a building, terrorist attacks. These are all examples of location-based emergencies. So uh, Regina mentioned ENS tools. A traditional ENS tool would be focused on communicating to employees based on their static location. The static location is the one that comes from the HR system and it basically tells the system John is based out of the Burlington office. Now, John may not be in the Burlington office all the time. He may be visiting customers, he may be traveling, he may be working remotely. So notifying him of weather alerts in, in Burlington is not enough. We need to have a broader way of communicating to John um, based on broader type of events and incidents. What if John is in Paris and there's a terrorist attack in Paris? First of all, we need to know who's going to be in Paris and then we need to have a reliable way of communicating to, to that traveler. So that's what brings us to the next generation ENS tool. We have decided to break down 
the concept of location. So a traditional ENS tool has a static location, which comes from the HR system. In a next generation ENS tool, we have decided to introduce three different location types. One is the static location that comes from HR. The next one is the last known location, which is where the employee is right now. And then the third one is the expected location of the employee, where the employee is going to be. So these are the three different location types that we are, consider we are taking into account for our next generation ENS product. And that helps us ensure the safety of local employees, loan workers, traveling employees and executives. Let's take a quick look at the Everbridge platform. The Everbridge platform has a lot of common services like the notification engine, location engine, rules engine, and its services are products on top. We have products that are focused on operational use cases, operational business continuity type use cases, as I mentioned before, such as IT alerting. And then we have products that are focused on life safety, like Safety Connection. All of these products have been built with the Everbridge model in mind. The Everbridge model is about assessing an event, locating who might be affected, automating your communications to, the, to those constituents and finally communicating to them in a reliable fashion. I want to go over these four steps with you today. The first step is about assessing the event. Um, Regina also alluded to this. You want to first decide whether this event is serious enough to communicate to your people or not. So you want to be able to visualize events on the map, you want to be able to see how far they are from your employees, from your physical assets. If you have buildings, if you have uh, loan workers, traveling employees, local employees, you want to be able to see how close they may be to the side of that crisis. The next step is to locate your people. You want to be able to know where people are based on their last known location, based on their static location, and their expected location. You want to be able to hover over a building icon and see how many people are in the building right now. So if I need to evacuate everyone from my building, how many people do I need to account for? Who are those people that I need to evacuate? So you want to, you want to have a visualization mechanism that gives you all that data at, one, you know, it, at first glance. The next step is to have all of your standard operating procedures in place because when a crisis happens, like an active shooter, terrorist attack, or a, a building fire, you really don't have a lot of time to be creating plans at that time. You don't have time to draft messages at that time either. Um, it's not a great time to be figuring out which group needs to receive which message, who are my responders and who are my constituents that I need to uh, communicate to. You want to have all of that in place. You want to have your standard operating procedures in place. You want to have your escalation paths in place and response teams already defined in a template. And you want to have those templates locked down so as few people as possible can edit them because you don't want the wrong message to go out at the time of crisis. So you want to have permissions and access controls on those templates. When you are working on automating your response to a crisis, there are some things to keep in mind. You want to have your response plan, uh, plans in a digital tool. So you can quickly put those uh, plans in the hands of your employees. You want to be able to just send those plans out so everyone has them. Wouldn't it be great if you could do that via a mobile device so that your employees would get it on their mobile device as well and they would have it with them at all times in their pocket. Now, when a crisis happens, collaboration is the next 
very important step. You want to be able to collaborate with your response team. Um, and you want to be able to do it all from the same tool. So collaboration is the next thing to keep in mind. The next step is to communicate reliably to your employees. You want to be able to communicate over multiple modalities. You want to be able to communicate the, uh, the plans to your employees, but also crisis uh, notifications to your employees. You want to be able to communicate um, over all the normal modalities like phone, SMS, email, pagers, and some uh, lesser known uh, communication paths such as outdoor sirens or digital signage. It is also important to have a simplified plan management. You don't want to have to spend a lot of time figuring out how to manage your plans. Your plans need to be in a centralized location. You need to be able to send out those plans to your employees in a very easy manner. And you want to be able to update and create new plans quickly and easily. So management of those plans are also uh, very important to streamline your organizational response to crisis. Finally, communication can be the most important part of this process. You want to be able to communicate the right message to the right group, and you want to be able to communicate it over multiple modalities. It is very common that when a major crisis happens, think Boston Marathon bombing, one modality can fail. During Boston Marathon bombing, um, the telecom providers were overwhelmed, the cell towers were overwhelmed, so communication over cell phone was temporarily uh, not available. Other forms of communication, however, such as push notifications or emails, um, landlines, etc., those forms of communication were still working reliably. So your, t your tool needs to be able to communicate over multiple modalities and uh, be reliable for all types of crisis. Everbridge happens to support over 100 different modalities. Some of them are the more common ones, which everyone is familiar with, like mobile phone, text message, email, landlines, and some of them are less common, like fax, like outdoor sirens, digital signage, etc. Also having redundancy for text messages are critical. Everbridge is the only company that supports two providers for over 200 countries on the map and uh, Everbridge has sent out over 1 billion messages in 2016. This year we are looking at 2 billion messages. Of course uh, a mobile uh, app is, is another way of communication, one of the hundred different uh, channels. It receives push notifications, and push notifications are a very reliable way of communication, especially in places in the world where SMS is not reliable. Push notifications are um, another great way to communicate to travelers, employees, um, and people who may be affected by a crisis. To quickly summarize the benefits of uh, one of our tools called Crisis Commander, it gives you the ability to access your plans quickly and send them out to your, to your people quickly. It provides you the ability to collaborate when a crisis happens, so your response team will be able to collaborate um, and work together to resolve a situation. Also, you'll be able to communicate to all of your constituents through multiple modalities. We talked about SMS, email, um, voice messages through mobile and landlines, audio bulletin boards, conference calls, etc. Even social media, like posting a message to Facebook or Twitter. And finally, have a very easy way to manage all of your plans, update them, um, be able to create new plans and be able to do analysis 
on your crisis response so you can optimize your processes uh, for the next event. Now I just want to open it up to uh, questions and um, see if there are any questions on the call. All right, thank you, Annie. Uh, we will be moving on to our question and answer portion of this session. Uh, we've got just a few minutes left, off, so we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, first question we have is for you, Annie. It's, can Everbridge be used outside of the U.S.? Absolutely. Everbridge uh, has global communications. So not only Everbridge supports multiple languages for notifications, we can also um, uh, deliver notifications outside of US because we have uh, relationships with local providers in places like India, China. We have lots of short codes. Um, there are some countries who offer short codes like uh, United Kingdom and uh, France. Countries that do offer short codes, we have those short codes for delivering SMS. Some countries only offer long codes. We also offer uh, a, a long list of those for our customers. Um, to ensure reliability of global communication. All right, thank you, Annie. Uh, next one we have is for you, Regina. How do you determine or define the criteria to activate your crisis plan? That's a great question. Uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, we used to have a, a long list of criteria based on impact, but we really found that the discussion of the five items that I mentioned is actually the most reliable. And you could also, if you if you were kind of a mathematical mind, you could actually probably attach your rating scale between one to five of each one of the five elements. And to go back and just talk about what those elements again. Uh, were is number one is people, is there an impact to people and life safety? Number two, is there an impact to building and facilities? Number three, is there an impact to our technology? Number four, is there an impact to our mission critical, time sensitive business processes? And then fifth, um, and the subjective one, which is, is there an impact to our reputation and brand? Some of our clients are kind of engineers and they want to have some kind of numerical count on that. So they basically have had a rating scale from one to five or one to ten in each one of those five items. They, they pick a, a number between one and five for each one of those and then they have a scale, you know, if it's less than 20, we don't activate it. If it's more than 20, we do, et cetera, et cetera. You can be that specific, but frankly, I'll be honest with you. When you talk to those five things, it becomes pretty clear that you're going to need to activate or not at the end of that discussion. All right, thank you, Regina. We are at just about our time, so we will wrap up with one final question. Uh, it is for you, Regina. What is the biggest mistake you see made during a crisis? Gosh, that's a great question. I think the first and uh, the biggest mistake I've seen is actually where people fail to activate soon enough. And many of my technology clients, I love to kid them because they're always saying, give me five more minutes, give me five more minutes, I know I can fix it. And that's very much what I see in corporate America because we don't have crises very often, which is wonderful, is that we're not necessarily always good when they first happen. And so it's getting your brain wrapped around it, getting the right people together to assess it quickly and making the decision to actually go. And what I would say to you is this, there's nothing wrong with calling your assessment team together and they make the decision, yeah, we're going to activate. And then a half an hour, an hour later, you think, okay, it's not that big a deal. Nothing wrong with that. It's like an exercise. It's far better to do that then to drag your feet, drag your feet, drag your feet, and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, we should have activated an hour ago. Yeah, that's the number one thing I think that I would put on my list. All right, thank you. And with that, we are going to wrap up for today. Uh, I want to thank Regina and Amy for a great webinar and to all of our attendees who are able to join us today. Uh, as a reminder, you will receive an email with a link to the recording of today's webinar and the slides by the end of the week. If you haven't already, please take a moment to follow us on Twitter at Everbridge and join our group on LinkedIn, Everbridge Incident Management and Emergency Notification Professionals. For those of you interested in seeing a demo of the Everbridge system, please visit everbridge.com slash request dash demo. Thank you all again for joining us today, and we hope to see you online again soon. Have a great day.